There is deals in any market and anyone who tells you there isn't, they're not working hard enough, right? So there's still a lot of great assumable loans out there that are still in the two and 3% rates. So there are always people that need to sell for whatever reason. So you just need to find those. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Maria Zondervan is the CEO of Blue Vikings Capital. She began investing in real estate in 1996, and she has over 25 years of experience and has worked in a variety of asset classes and sizes. Maria, welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much for coming on today. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Oh, my. Well, I started back in college. I bought my first place before I even graduated um, college. So, and then I just kept investing throughout my life, really, alongside being an endangered species biologist, because that was my passion. But I knew I would never make money doing that. Um, that's just a passion, but so real estate uh, let me do that. And today I am buying large apartment complexes and um, looking, looking to the future, see what the next uh, big challenge is. Wow, an endangered species biologist. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty fun. Now you're based where? In Florida. Florida. Yeah. Okay, right. So you're in Florida. Did you work specifically in Florida? Did you work all over the world? Or what was your... Uh, I did work specifically in Florida. We got plenty of critters here to keep you busy. Everything from gators and snakes to birds and turtles, manatees, eagles, you name it. We got it all right here. You got it all right here. And you worked in that field, but also were growing your kind of own real estate holdings along the way. Yes. At what point in time, what was the catalyst for you that said, okay, we're going to go bigger and do bigger assets and bigger things in the real estate space? Um, I actually had an autistic son, you know, wasn't part of the plan. Nobody plans for these things, but hey. having a special needs child all of a sudden puts a whole lot more emphasis on you growing your wealth because you got to take care of them forever and uh, beyond your own lifespan. So it became more important. And uh, the, the, closer he got to adulthood, the more I decided maybe I should leave this thing I'm very passionate about because I'm even more passionate about my son and, and make the leap to real estate full-time. And so finally I did that. Got it. What did you start investing in? And, and I guess what was the, what was the strategy you took on? Cause everybody, okay. So now you've got a, you've kind of got a why defined for you, but then how are you going to go about meeting the needs of that? Why? Yeah, I mean, the, the strategy was multifamily, and um, I approached that by joining masterminds, get around the right people, the right networks, and uh, they will help point you in the right way, right? You don't have to learn it all. You just have to know all the people who know it all, right? And so, th so that was it. We knew multifamily was the path. We knew that was where to scale, so I started educating myself on that and getting around people who do that until they made it look easy. And then I was like, okay, I can do this. And so I did. That's uh, that's very, very cool. So where are you today in that multifamily acquisition kind of uh, process? Because I know a lot of people, uh, you know, the bigger institutions are pencils down. We're recording this. What is this? This is uh, April 18th of 2023. You know, a lot of people are pens da pencils down. There's some apprehension in the multifamily space. But it sounds like for you, you guys have found a niche that you're very not just competent in, but, um, you know, you'll find a lot of opportunity in. So talk to us about that if you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is deals in any market and anyone who tells you there isn't, they're not working hard enough, right? So and there's still a lot of great assumable loans out there that are still in the 2 and 3% rates. So there are always people that need to sell for whatever reason. So you just need to find those. We really like the affordable housing um, niche because there's such a demand for that right now. And because properties are valued on the income they produce, a lot of times you can pick them up a few years before they exit out of some of the affordable housing programs where you're buying them at the NOI, NOI that they're at now, knowing they're going to jump up in a few years. So that can be a really strong play. And then we also buy um, forever holds or we're actually building or creating them in some cases. And this is um, partly through my nonprofit, which is Valhalla Villas, um, which their mission is to provide housing and services for autistic adults like my son. And so those properties will never be sold, right? So those are things people can invest in and for, have a forever income. And so we're not real worried about, is it 
providing a huge return right now because long term it's going to provide buckets of money, right? So it's just a matter of which investors you have and what they're looking for. And for me, I'm, I'm looking for people who are trying to set up um, the future generations. Right. Now that's really, really interesting. I want to, I mean, you're, you're tackling a lot there all at once from taking right. care <laughs> of your own family, from then setting up investments from what it sounds like for other families with similar, similar needs, and then also going out and playing, you know, just openly in the affordable housing sector. So, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of different pieces going or a lot of different parts of or moving parts there inside of that. Let's talk a little bit maybe about the affordable housing component. You'd mentioned you like affordable housing. The demand is there, uh, but yet some of these, uh, some of these properties may be exiting that affordable housing criteria here in the next two or three years when then it can be more to market rate. Right. Go, go into detail on that if you can. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So there's like light tech and programs like that where they basically, they put a cap on what you can charge for rent. And so that caps out what your NOI is, your net operating income, and therefore the value of the property. So we buy it at that. And then as those restrictions come off, then you can push them closer to market rents. Now, we typically don't go all the way to market rents because we believe in affordable housing. We want to keep it affordable. So actually, by us buying it versus somebody else that would push it all the way up to, to market rents, we're, we're, we're doing a bit of a service there, too. But we're also helping our investors. So some of our investors, they still need to grow short-term income and turn their money quickly. So this is a way for them to do that before they move into long-term holds. So they have more to put into those long-term holds. So we're kind of trying to service both sectors by offering investment opportunities, both for short-term and long-term investors. And for those that just want to have a mixed portfolio, but those properties are awesome because they're always full. You know, there's always a waiting list to get into those properties. So it's a very safe investment. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was gonna be one of my questions there was in the, um, in the light tech resident base, I'll use that term, the, the resident base that, that needs a light tech or utilizes a, a, a light tech property. How is that tenant performing right now? I mean, things have gotten a little harder. I would think that's one of the first kind of um, income brackets to start getting squeezed. How are those, how are those deals performing right now? They're actually performing just, just fine. So we're not buying rough properties. We're buying nice B class type mm -hmm. properties. This is not C and D class assets. We're not talking, you know, section eight necessarily. Um, a lot of people associate LIHTC with section eight or low income housing with that sort of stuff. It, it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Some of these properties are brand new built, beautiful properties with pools and clubhouses. So I, I think it's, there's some education that has to go into that, especially with your investors who may have that mindset of thinking it, it's slum kind of stuff. It isn't. Um, you can have really nice affordable housing and the affordable criteria is based on what you're providing. So what is affordable in a three bedroom, two bath townhouse community of this sort, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, um, it's not a one size fits all. Got it. Got it. No, that's really cool. And that's, I mean, even that's some education, for me, you know, because I, I don't I don't play in that space very much, mm -hmm. and it uh, I don't I don't understand the types of assets that even go into low income housing tax credit properties. So that's really cool to hear that there are really nice brand new build ass assets that you guys can build or not build but buy and um, you know run as as a light tech property. So that's really really cool, and I like the fact that in your affordable housing you're keeping it even when that affordable housing period or the light tech period burns off. You're still keeping, you know, rents where that tenant base can still uh, afford that. Let's talk about assumable loans. That's something you had mentioned as well. I think that's a really cool strategy. I think it's a gold mine right now is buying properties with assumable loans in that fixed two and a half to three and a half, four percent even range. How are you finding those, and why are sellers selling those? Um, well, I can give you an example of a why just recently. Um, had uh, it was a well, and the how kind of ties into two a broker we had worked with multiple times knew we would close knew we were good at that and so he brought us this deal where basically partnership was falling apart mm. so I, I talked to a syndication attorney recently who says she will not even set up syndications where there are more than five partners she sure. says there's just too many cooks in the kitchen and often it falls apart and yep. this was exactly that there were eight partners 
wow. trying to all decide how to do it. It wasn't a syndication, it was just a partnership, but um, but there are just too many and they could not agree on a strategy. And so finally they all just threw up their hands and said, we're selling, you know? And they had this great assumable loan and, um, you know, we're willing to to take terms and, and uh, negotiate on price. And so, cause we knew we had to make up, you know, usually you have to bring a little more to the table, a little more cash to the table, right? But your investors still want return. So they're willing to negotiate with you, especially when they're stressed and one out of something. How did you get, uh, it sounds like if they can't decide or can't agree on how to operate the property, getting that many partners to agree on what the terms are for sale could also end up being a bit of a quagmire. Yes, yes. And this is why we're still in negotiations on it. So this is an active active deal, um, but we're getting close. And yes, that's exactly the problem is, is getting everybody to terms. But you have to be a little more patient with them. You don't push. Um, you just tell them you're there to listen. You listen to all their problems and all their complaints about all their other partners. And you talk to them one on one, uh, one at a time, all eight partners. You eventually make the deal. Wow! Yeah, that's that's a sound piece of advice. There's a, there's a there's a there's something that should go in the playbook. You talk to them one at a time. Yeah, because I imagine the sparks would fly if there's if there's already tension. Getting all of them together to talk about it probably would not be a good a good move. I think back to a, a property we tried to acquire. Gosh, what was it? Twenty early, maybe maybe late twenty nineteen, and they had owned it since nineteen hundred. And so wow. imagine all of the heirs. Yeah, it was it was a piece of raw land, but it was all the heirs that went in cousins and cousins on cousins, and people don't even know each other. Needless oh to say, goodness. needless to say, there was one person in the entire in the entire realm. One person did not want the deal to go through, and it completely yeah. just derailed the whole process. And it was and it was over it was over pennies. And it just and it, it, anyway, I think back on that and the amount of time we put into it. I go, that, you gotta find the one thing that person does want. Yeah. Is it a Corvette? Is it a statue of themselves? What is it? <laughs> what is it exactly? And you give it to them. <laughs> it feels good enough. Yeah, right. Exactly. Here, here's your st statue. That's funny. I'm going to remember that one. That, uh, that's a real thing. That's an actual case. Um, yeah. That's, heard that one on a, on a, at a conference I was at. Somebody literally, he didn't want his kids to inherit the property but he wanted something to, he just hated his kids for some reason, but he wanted something as a legacy, but it wasn't going to be his kids. So the guy said, what if I put up a statue of you on the property and you sell me the property? And he said, yeah, and he gave it to him at a killer deal. <laughs> That's the funniest yeah. thing I've heard all day. Wow. It's, it's not from my playbook, but it's, it's a good one. There you go. I like it. I like it. Start offering the absurd and they might take you up on it. That's uh, that's fantastic. Find out what they want. Yeah. Absolutely. What is it they want? Absolutely. They want a legacy. Let's talk a little bit. That's funny. Thank you for sharing that. That, that that's too. That's, that's that's yeah. That's some funny stuff right there. Tell me about the nonprofit you're running. I know that's a big part of your why, uh, but tell me how you've done that. And then I want to hear. So let's hear a little bit about that. And then I want to hear about uh, just ways that you've scaled your business because because you've got again a lot of things going on. So I can imagine that you've you've just had a lot of um, processes and systems and things you've had to put in place in order to make this all possible. So let's hear first about the nonprofit. Yeah, so um, Valhalla Villas is the name of the nonprofit. And the idea is to provide housing um, for autistic individuals who are longing for that independence, but they can't fully live on their own, right? So 75% of autistic adults end up living with their parents forever. But the fact is parents aren't always going to be there. And so those parents worry about who's going to take care of them later. And there's often this strive when they get in their 30s and 40s, you know, they want to be fully independent, but they're still living in that parent's house. And so the parent's still trying to control, you know. And so here they can live in community where there's services that take care of them. There's somebody there to look after them. They can have roommates to cut down the costs of it. And they can learn independent living skills while there, have transportation provided, because that's another biggie. They often don't drive and things like that. So kind of meets that need. And the need right now is huge because one in every 44 kids in the U.S. is now diagnosed with autism. I know. Blows, blows my mind. Yeah. How did you get that off the ground? I mean, that's... I'm thinking drivers, that's buses, that's, uh, you know, yeah. there's there's got to be some considerations on the way the properties are built on, I mean, so many things go into that. Like, how did you do it? Yeah. So so ask me again in a year because it's not fully off the ground yet. So okay. 
this is this is a fairly new venture, but we are partnering with other nonprofits that have actually done this. Okay. They just haven't done it for autistic individuals. They're servicing other special needs. Sure. So we're basically stealing their playbooks. Yeah. <laughs> and they're happy to share it with us because they know the need is tremendous. So um, yeah, we're kicking it off here in Central Florida. And then we're going to take it nationwide because it's a very scalable plan. So two things we're going to build from the ground up using Litech funds. Mm. They have a special pocket just for special needs to do this. And then the, the other model is integrated housing where we buy existing apartment complexes, which we already know how to do. Right. And we integrate the services and shift about 25% of the population over to autistic adults. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll have to keep tabs on this. Keep us posted on how uh, how this all all unfold, but that's a really cool, a really cool undertaking. Let's talk about scaling. What are some things you feel like you've done really well when it comes to scaling and growing your business that other people should emulate? I think it's all about the networking, getting in the rooms with the right people. It's amazing when you start talking to people about what you want to do, how many people are willing to help, you know, or just share their knowledge if you're in the right rooms. So be in the rooms with the people who are ahead of you. And when you start to be the most knowledgeable person in that room, move to the next room. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's absolutely great. What about when it comes to team? How, how have you approached and or tackled the issue of team? Teams are tough. So I tried to do most of it through partnerships instead of employees. <laughs> Um, primarily, because, well, for one thing, it's less expensive. You're, you're doing equity splits. They're going to get more in the end, but um, you're not having to come up with the money up front, which is very beneficial. Right. But also, it's easier to break apart. You know, if things aren't working, you can bring someone in on one deal or two deals. And if things aren't working well and you don't want to go forward and do more deals with them, you don't have to because you didn't form. They're not in your corporation necessarily. Right. Right, right. No, I like that. I like that. And that certainly has been an, an approach that I've seen a lot of people take is that more partnership side of things. Let's rewind maybe the conversation a little bit where you were talking earlier about partnerships and the challenges that you can face inside of those partnerships and then working through a deal you're buying because of a partnership gone bad. How should someone evaluate a partnership like that to make sure that they don't end up in that same spot maybe that some of these sellers you're dealing with right now are? Well, you should definitely know the people you're getting in into it with, right? Uh, people talk about it being a marriage. You're going to be together with those people for a long time, especially if it's like a forever hold, you know, something like that. So you better know those people pretty well. Don't jump at the first person that says, hey, I can KP your deal or I've got, you know, the net worth is to sign for this giant loan and you're all excited about that. There are lots and lots of people who can do that. Find the right fit. So it's about knowing what your vision is and and finding people that fit that, right? Don't try to fit theirs. Make sure that they're fitting into your needs. So if you if you have a mission statement, if you have your core values, you're looking for people that fit that. You're not going to alter your mission statement or core values to to fit those people. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. I love that. I absolutely love it. Maria, you've given us so much here to think about today. Everything from acquiring class B uh, Litech properties and how you can buy even those uh, brand new uh, uh, Litech properties. Talk about affordable housing components. We've talked about um, the way that you're meeting the needs of special needs families and building uh, your Val, Val, I can't even pronounce that, Valhalla? Valhalla. It's Viking, Valhalla. just like Blue Vikings. You know, there's a theme here. I'm Got it. It's, in, it's in the blood. I got it. I love it. Valhalla Villas uh, and just how you're stealing that playbook. I mean, it goes back to even the success leaves clues thing. Like, hey, we'll just go take what somebody else is doing and then we'll repeat that, but but bring it over to the uh, to the autistic community. So I love love what you're doing. Very, very cool. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Uh, BlueVikingsCapital.com. All my social media links are there. There's links to Valhalla. There's links to everything there. So start with BlueVikingsCapital.com. BlueVikingsCapital.com. We will make sure we put that there in the show notes. Maria, thank you again for coming on the show today. I certainly appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, 
If you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.